Welcome back, folks. To... Why is this not picking up? Just a moment. Let's see. Da, da, da. Is that better? That's better, alright. Welcome back to Planescape Torment. Let's resume life. So, if I recall correctly, we want to go right. upstairs. And we want to find the key to the portal to get out of this place. I was thinking about uh, that first episode, and I'm not really going to explain a lot of stuff about Planescape, because the game will. I'll be reading a lot. This I'm is uh, more reedy, probably even than Tyranny, but I think it's more fun reading than Tyranny is. Not that Tyranny is not well written or anything, but this has a certain zazz, zip to it, you know. Okay, we got some junk. We want to avoid the dust men because they're going to be all bent out of shape that we're in here when we're alive. Crowbar. To attack this. I know it's locked. Let's attack it. There we go. Look at that. Eighty-three dollars. Or no, forty-six dollars. Uh, and a bunch of healing items. And by a bunch, I mean two. Let's read this. This is the Dustman Request. A note written on a scrap of dry parchment. Contact the necromancer responsible for raising Contractual Worker 42. I know he's examined the skeleton before, but I'm certain the initial raising of the body was, was warped. The worker still responds to commands, but when it has completed a task, it resumes pacing in a same circular pattern as it did before. Dahl recently informed me that Worker 42 exhibited that same walking pattern when it was a zombie decades ago. There may be a soul echo in the marrow of the skeleton's age, uh, or the skeleton's age may have caused the magic animating him to decay. One of the initiates suggested that it may be following an order issued by a higher ranking dustman in the past, but I have no record of such an order. Whatever the reason for its behavior, the matter is to be resolved or the worker replaced. So that was something we saw a little bit before with that, uh, that one zombie that kept walking in a triangle. And Mort told us about the rule of threes, one of those rules about the planes. Yeah, she's like standing right in front of the bookcase I need, I think. Can you move? Why are you standing there? Ah, there we are. Better get some distance. Mortuary Sanctum Key. Let's see what we got over here. Hammer, that'll come in handy later. Now we're just roombaing up junk. Mortuary task list, is that interesting? Uh, this is just, you know, what do we do if the uh, zombies that are working start to wear out and stuff, and you're re-raising orders and stuff like that. It's all very flavorful, but I've got enough reading to do. Oh, we're gonna sneak right on this one too. Needle and thread. Oh, this guy tells us to hold. Think again. All right. 
Okay, let's go downstairs. I'm gone. And we were told to look in the northwest corner. Actually, I want to talk to one of these giant skeletons. Before you is a giant skeleton in ornate bronze armor. The armor has been bolted onto the skeleton's frame, and a series of elaborate symbols have been carved across the breastplate. You wonder where the skeleton came from. You weren't aware they made humans in this size. The huge blade in its hands looks like it weighs as much as a wagon cart. I'm gonna examine the giant skeleton carefully. The skeleton's intricate bronze armor is riveted onto its rib cage and shoulder blades with a series of iron bolts. As you study the frame beneath, behind the armor, you notice the same iron bolts are set into the skeleton's shoulder, elbow, pelvic, and knee joints. A mass of thick leather cords and heavy knotted ropes run along the length of the skeleton's arms and legs, woven in such a pattern that they resemble muscles and tendons. I'll examine the armor. Despite the armor's obvious age, it looks well cared for. It shines brightly, and the symbols engraved on the breastplate seem to flow in the firelight, shifting slightly whenever you try to focus on them. Study the symbols. Almost unconsciously, you let your gaze relax as you look at the symbols. After a moment, the symbols cease shifting and resolve into a trail of runes that run up and down the breastplate. Strangely enough, the interlocking pattern of runes reminds you of chains, and with that thought, you suddenly recall that these runes are some sort of warding enchantment. Study the runes, try and recall the enchantment. You study the pattern of the runes as they weave their way across the breastplate. On its most basic level, the runes are a lesser and armoring enchantment, but several skull-shaped runes and spherical tracings along the edges of the armor make you suspect several greater necromantic and warding enchantments are, wover are woven in as well. Touching the skeleton will most likely cause it to awaken and defend itself. See if you can dispel the enchantment somehow. You suspect that marring the rune pattern along the breastplate could unravel the enchantments, but it looks difficult. The pattern is complicated, and scratching out the wrong portion would cause the skeleton to animate. So I think we want to mar the runes maintaining the warding enchantment first, then work backward through the rune pattern, cancelling the necromantic, then the armoring enchantment. The work is difficult and nerve-wracking at first, but slowly your mind begins to focus, and the runes begin to unravel beneath your attack. Within minutes, the giant skeleton has been stripped of the enchantments binding it. It collapses, falling to the floor with a crash of bones and a heavy clanging noise. Damn pile of bones! You wait for a moment, but no one responds to the sound. Moving quickly, you sift through the skeleton's parts on the floor. Most of it is too heavy or too old to be useful but you discover a piece of the skeleton's breastplate with a majority of one of the armored broken enchantments engraved on it. You have a feeling that it could be useful. I'll just take it then. This rune of lesser warding. So I'm not a wizard yet, I can't actually do anything with that. That'll be one of the first orders of business when we get out of the mortuary here. But for now, a fateful encounter. You see a striking, strikingly beautiful ghostly form before you. Her arms are crossed and her eyes are closed. She has long, flowing hair, and her gown seems stirred by some ethereal breeze. As you watch, she stirs slightly, and her eyes flicker. Greetings. You! What is it that brings you here? Have you come to see firsthand the misery you have wrought? Perhaps in death I still hold some shred of use for you, my love. My love, do I know you? The spirit makes a begging motion with her hands. How can it be that the thieves of the mine continue to steal my name from your memory? Do you not remember me, my love? The ghost stretches out her arms. Think. Her voice becomes desperate again. 
The name Dianera must evoke some memory within you. No, I'm sorry. My memories are lost to me. Then it is as I feared. I'm truly lost to you, and what was once an inconvenience for you, you now have the... Yeah, you now have the excuse to discard me as you have my memory. Inconvenience? Discard you? I do not know you, spirit. My memories are no more. Tell me, who are you? What do you know of me? You are the one who is both blessed and cursed, my love. And you are one who is never far from my thoughts and heart. Blessed and cursed? What do you mean? The nature of your curse should be apparent, my love. Look at you, she points at you. Death rejects you. Your memories have abandoned you. Do you not pause and wonder why? I'm still trying to get my bearings, actually. What else can you tell me about myself? I know that you once claimed you loved me, and that you would love me until death claimed us both. I believed that, never knowing the truth of who you were, what you were. And what am I? You, I cannot, she suddenly freezes, and she speaks slowly, carefully, as if her voice frightens her. The truth is, you are the one who dies many deaths. These deaths have given the knowing of all things mortal, and in your hand lies the spark of life and death. Those that die near you carry a trace of themselves that you can bring forth. As Dianera speaks the words, a crawling sensation wells up in the back of your skull. You suddenly feel compelled to look at your hand. As you lift it up and look at it, you can see the blood coursing sluggishly through your arm, pouring into your muscles, and in turn giving strength to your bones. What? Updated my journal. And you know DNR is right. You suddenly remember how to coax the dimmest spark of life from a body and bring it forth. The thought both horrifies you and intrigues you. So we get a free kind of raise ability there at level one, which is nuts, but oh well. I, I, I had other questions. What is it you wish to know? Who are you? Oh, hang on. <laughs> that just uh, took us back through that. Okay. Can you tell me where I am? Where are you? Why, you're here with me, my love. As in the times when life was something both of us shared. Now it is the eternal boundary that separates us. Eternal boundary? Dear Anara sounds saddened. It is a barrier I fear you shall never cross, my love. It is the barrier between your life and what remains of mine. I see more questions Let's see I need to escape this place can you help me as you're about to ask Dianera the question it catches in your throat it occurs to you that if you tell her you are looking for an escape route she may feel you are abandoning her if you're going to ask her how to leave you'll need to be delicate about it this is like tutorializing actually almost kind of how you should approach dialogue in this game Dianara, I'm in danger. Can you guide me to a place of safety? I shall, I shall return as soon as I can to speak to you again. In danger? Dianara looks concerned. Of course, my love. I will aid you any way I can. She closes her eyes for a moment, and you watch an ethereal zephyr pass through her body, stirring her hair. After a moment, the zephyr dies, and her eyes slowly open. Perhaps there is a way. Yes. I sense that this place holds many doors shrouded from mortal eyes. Perhaps you could use one of these portals as a means of escape. Portals? Portals are holes in existence, leading to destinations in the inner and outer planes. If you could find the proper key, you could escape through one of them. Key. DNR pauses for a moment, as if attempting to remember. Portals will reveal themselves when you have the proper key. Unfortunately, these keys can be almost anything, an emotion, a piece of wood, 
a dagger of silvered glass, a scrap of cloth, a tune you hum to yourself. I fear that the dustmen are the only ones who would know the keys you could use to leave their halls, my love. Then I shall ask one of them. Farewell, Dianera. Hold a moment. I learned much when I traveled with you, my love, and what you've lost, I've retained. I've not divulged all that I know to you. My sight is clear, whilst you fumble in the darkness for a spark of thought. And what is it your sight sees that I do not? Time itself relaxes its hold as the chill of oblivion slowly claims us, my love. Glimpses of things yet to come swarm across my vision. I see you, my love. I see you as you are now, and... What is it? What do you see? I see what lies ahead for you. It ripples through the plains, stemming outward from this point. Shall I speak of what I see? Tell me. First, I require a promise. Promise you will return, that you will find some means to save me or join me. I will do what I can. Deanera stiffens. She looks as if she's about to say something, then sighs in defeat. Very well, my love. As before, I shall have to place my trust in you. She closes her eyes. This is what my eyes see, my love. Unfettered by the shackles of time. You shall meet enemies three, but none more dangerous than yourself in your full glory. They are shades of evil, of good, and of neutrality. Even life and twisted by the laws of the plains. You shall come to a prison built of regrets and sorrow, where the shadows themselves have gone mad. There you will be asked to make a terrible sacrifice, my love. For the matter to be laid to rest, you must destroy that which keeps you alive and be immortal no longer. Destroy what keeps me alive? I know that you must die. While you still can, the circle must come to a close, my love. You are not meant for this life. You must find that which was taken from you and travel beyond, into the lands of the dead. Die while I still can. Updated my journal. I do not doubt your ability to rise from the dead. I do believe that every incarnation weakens your thoughts and memories. You can't claim you've lost your memory. Perhaps it's a side effect of countless deaths? If so, what more will you lose in successive deaths? If you lose your mind, you will not even know enough to realize that you cannot die. You shall truly be doomed. Countless deaths? How long has this been going on? I do not truly know, except that it has gone on long enough. Farewell, Dianara. I shall wait for you in death's halls, my love. love, love. She smiles, but there is only sadness in it. She closes her eyes, and with an ethereal whisper, she fades. You back with me, chief? You kind of drifted out on me there. No, I'm fine. Do you know who that spirit was? Eh? Spirit? That specter I was talking to. The woman. You were rattling your bone box with some woman? Where? He looks around excited. What'd she look like? She was right on top of the beer. Didn't, didn't you see her? And no, he just kind of drifted out for a bit there. Just stood there, statue-like. I was a little worried you'd gone addled on me again. No, I'm fine, I think. Let's move on. Alright, and the portal's right around here. I think it might be this one. Yep. So because we have the bone charm here in the shape of it's that the finger and a crook kind of thing did I use this? Uh, this copper earring looks extremely old it looks like it was meant to be worn but there doesn't seem to be a hook or any means of actually attaching it to your ear there is a series of strange grooves on the inside of the earring, though. Examine the grooves. 
Grooves are evenly placed along the inside of the earring. Upon closer examination, they remind you of small fangs. They're definitely man-made, but you can't figure out what they're intended for. So I'll have to figure that out later. But let's leave the mortuary. Planescape right. starts here. Let's take this money. Let me read this note. Uh, Pen's note. This note has been written with remarkable penmanship upon the finest parchment. Vaxus. If you're reading this, then you've undoubtedly failed in your task and have been forced to use the escape route I arranged. I told you that your little disguise idea was ridiculous. In any case, you'll need to lay low for a while. The dustmen may be deluded, but they're not fools, and they'll certainly seek retribution for our intrusion. I've left you some coins. Use them to secure a hiding place in the hive, preferably in Ragpecker Square. The dustmen will be unwilling to look for you there. Once you've secured a new hiding place, I have a new mission for you. Find out where Farad is getting those bodies he's delivering to the mortuary. It's apparently causing the dustmen a great deal of upset, and I wouldn't mind knowing myself. Reports are that the stone-faced dustman at the Gathering Dust Bar, Initiate Emmerich, I think the fool's name is, has been sending out finders to try and mark Farad's movements. See if you can find out how far along he is and hinder his efforts until we know more about Farad's activities. I don't want Emmerich finding out something before we do. Pen. So one thing I will explain about uh, Planescape as a setting is that it has a lot to do with these factions in this city. The city of Sigil. That here we are. And yeah, it's, it's I don't know why it's pronounced Sigil, but it is. But this is a a city that exists exists kind of at the crossroads of all planes, atop an an infinitely tall spire. Which makes no sense, and that's kind of the point. So luckily we can highlight and see that when people have names. So our first order of business is getting another companion. We can probably get Dakan in this episode, and I really want to do all the mage stuff um, so I can become a mage just as soon as possible. I think this is the one. Smoldering Corpse Bar. Let's look at the, the titular Smoldering Corpse here. This crackling, billowing creature twists slowly above an iron grill upon the floor of the bar. It may have once been human, but now its skin is charred beyond recognition. Streams of fire form a wreath around the creature's body, and the flames lick at the few remaining pockets of flesh, causing them to bubble and run like wax down the creature's skeletal frame. Examine the smoldering corpse. The heat surrounding this creature is incredible. To your surprise, the iron grill the creature floats above has sagged and bent from the heat. At first you thought the heat came from the grill, but now you realize it emanates from the creature. As you watch, flecks of ash drift from the withering, the writhing corpse and float slowly to the ceiling. Greetings. The thing makes no response. It rides slowly within the flames. It lives, but it does not seem aware of anything other than the fire that surrounds it. Its skin is flame, its heart is flame, and you know, within some shadowed corner of your memory, that this thing is dangerous. Let's leave it alone, in that case. I'm gone. Talk to this fellow up here. Name a Dakon, or Dakon. The man before you is old, 
His dry yellow skin has the scars of one who's traveled everywhere and never rested long in any one place. His pinched face is inhumanly angular, and his ears sweep out from his skull, tapering to points. He wears a loose-fitting orange tunic, and a strange shimmering blade is strapped across his back. The blade looks to be a two-pronged glaive, made of some metal whose surface swirls like a film of oil on a pond. Greetings. The man turns to you, his eyes like polished coal. He stares through you, and for a moment, you wonder if he might be blind. The weapon suddenly turns into a dead, flat black, mirroring the man's eyes. Are you alright? Hail, traveler. He says nothing for a moment, merely searches your face with his eyes. Hail, traveler. His voice is quiet and somber, like a wind whispering through the branches of a great tree. of the weight of one who has traveled far to be in this place. Uh, so as he said that, he met my gaze, and his weapon drained of its black color, resuming its shimmering that I noticed when I first spoke to him. You could say that. The man's gaze does not waver from you. I am known as Dakan. The emphasis he, sp the emphasis he places on the word known strikes you as odd, yet familiar at the same time. You are not known to me. I do not know myself. That is for the best. In knowing, in knowing yourself, there would be little in the plains left worth knowing. He falls silent for a moment, still studying you with his coal black eyes. I would know why you've come to the city. I'm not going to do a voice for Dakon because it's too close to the nameless one. <laughs> Let's see. I'm looking for answers. I have many questions. Speak your questions. I will hear you. Your features are unfamiliar to me. What are you? A gith Sarai. A gith Sarai? A gith Sarai is one of the people. One of the people? A gith Sarai. Yes, but what are the gith Sarai exactly? <laughs> Sorry, God, I'm messing up my voices. What are the Githsarai exactly? Takan is silent for a moment, then speaks. Our history does not need to be made known to you. We would bleed to death on time's blade before I recited a fraction of the histories of our people. I don't need to know your histories, but I would know of your people as they are now. Takan is silent for a moment. Know this, and accept it as an answer. We are the people who make our home upon the shifting plane of limbo. With a deft motion, Dakan slips the blade from his back and holds it before him. Let's wait and see what happens. There, we mold the matter of limbo with our minds. We forge cities with our thoughts. As you watch, a series of rippling waves of metal begin to roll forth from the center of the blade. The pitch and crest of the waves match the inflections in Dakan's voice. In its chaos we dwell, with only our knowing to preserve us. We are the Githsarai. Sarai. What is that blade you have? It moved, shifted in response to your voice. It is a Karak blade. It is an object that lets others know the rank of the wielder. Karak? What does that mean? Dakan falls silent for a moment, as if searching for the correct words. In your tongue, the closest translation is chaos matter. The people may shape it with our thoughts. Shape it with their thoughts. Karach is not shaped by heat, but by knowing oneself. It is a mirror that reflects the will of the wielder on its surface and its edge. When one knows themselves, the blade is strong, harder and stronger than de steel. When one does not know themselves, the blade is as water, formless and weak. What rank does the blade signify? The blade is a symbol carried by a Zerth. A Zerth is one who knows the words of Zerthamon. In knowing the words of Zerthamon, they know themselves. Zerthamon. Zerthamon founded our race. He knew the Giths arrived before they knew themselves. He defined the people. He gave them one mind. I had some other questions. Can you tell me about this city? It is known by the name Sigil. 
Among the people, it is known as the city that does not know itself. It doesn't know itself? What do you mean? The city exists, but it does not know itself. And not knowing itself, its existence is flawed. How is it flawed? The city exists in opposition to itself. It has set itself apart from the plains, yet it seeks to be everywhere at once. Its walls are doors, yet it keeps these doors locked. Such an existence tells of a thing that does not know itself. In not knowing itself, it is flawed. What if the city is not flawed? A thing does not need to be ordered and have a purpose to know itself. What if these contradictions are strengths that you cannot see? To your question, a question. What if the city is flawed and you see its contradictions all around you? To your question, a question. You claim the city's existence is flawed. You've accepted this rather than explore the possibility that something greater may exist. That suggests you are flawed and that you do not search for knowledge, but only for a convenient answer. To Khan falls silent. There is no knowing the answer to the questions we have asked, yet the city exists, that is all. Yet I would maintain that we know ourselves by the questions we ask and the ones we do not. If we cease, ask cease asking questions and accept only what we can perceive, then we will cease to know ourselves. Dekan's voice has changed slightly, become heavier. Such words have been spoken before. I've heard them and know them. Where have you heard them? The words are mine. Once I knew them and knew their meaning. I'd forgotten them until you spoke. Dekan's gaze travels through you, and his blade stops shimmering, bleeding of all color until it's translucent. There is a moment of silence, and then Dekan looks up at you. I would travel your path with you. I accept. An extra blade would be welcome. Your path is mine. Strangely enough, his voice seems distant, and it echoes as if he was speaking from across a great distance. Very well. Let's go. Ooh, looks like my skills have increased. Hey, we leveled up. And we get an attribute point, which I think I want to put in a wisdom. Because wisdom is really important for recovering memories, which is where a lot of our experience is going to come from in this game. Because we are already a very powerful wizard. We've been every class that we could possibly be across zillions of lifetimes. So it's not so much gaining skills as remembering them. And more leveled up, which is good. So let's save it there. And call it for this episode. So I will see you guys next time. Bye.